My name is Eric Bauman, and uh, I will be presenting Superset Disassembly, Statically Rewriting x86 Binaries Without Heuristics. This is a joint work with my advisor, uh, Professor Zishang Lin, and uh, Professor Kevin Hamlin from the University of Texas at Dallas. So it is a fact of the world today that there are binaries everywhere, and it's usually the case that you will need to um, change a, a program, you may not have the source code. In many cases, you just won't have it. So uh, it, it, ideally, you would want to be able to modify a binary uh, a program anyway, even if you do not have the source code available. If you could just transform a program to have the functionality that you want without uh, requiring any, any source code access. So uh, s static binary re rewriting is a very uh, important uh, approach to, to take. So a lot of researchers agree with this because there's a lot of prior work that exists that um, has stretched from uh, Etch in 1997 through uh, Rambler in 2017. Uh, however, unfortunately, these tools rely on various uh, heuristics in rewriting code. They make assumptions. And that brings me to Multiverse, which is the first heuristic-free static rewriter in which you do not uh, have any assumptions made in the binary rewriting. So we base this idea on the concept of the multiverse in which the, uh, there are multiple universes and each universe has different things happen in it, so if something doesn't happen in our universe, it happened potentially in some other universe. Everything that can happen does happen. So we apply the same idea to code that any, uh, any code that could potentially execute does execute. So this brings me to the, uh, the fundamental challenges that all static uh, rewriters must face when Rewriting, uh, rewriting code. So uh, static binaries have to face these challenges. Uh, in some ways, a rewriter has to face this challenge. So uh, previous works have addressed this in various ways, and some of the solutions that I'll be talking to, they apply some of the solutions that we'll be talking about, but none of them applied all of the solutions that we applied, and none of them approached it from an uh, 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 approach of trying to handle uh, w rewriting without any heuristics. So in order to discuss this, this problem, I'm going to introduce a simple working example that will show a lot of the challenges that you encounter when rewriting a binary. So this example prints uh, an array in ascending or descending order depending on whether the process ID is even or odd. So this is something that is not statically determinable. You cannot know from static analysis what branch will be taken in this binary. So uh, there's a few other parts of this simple working example. Here is some handwritten assembly with some inline data. And here are some comparison functions which are used for the, the sorting. LT and GT are used in order to, to sort this, this array. So the first challenge that we see when rewriting a binary is recognizing addresses statically. So you can see here that the modes array is an array of function pointers. And when you look at the data section of the binary, you have the two addresses that were seen in the, um, in the, uh, in the function pointer array. So the problem is, how do you distinguish a pointer-like integer from a pointer. So this is a difficult challenge, and uh, a, an interesting way to get around it is just keep the original uh, text and data sections intact, so any references to these will be still valid. So if you have a, an, a pointer that points to some data in the text section, it remains in place unchanged, and so the references are still valid. Unfortunately, this brings us to the second challenge. You, uh, any, any references to data are OK, but we still are changing the code when we rewrite a binary. So when you actually have the call to one of the function pointers in the array, this call to modes p here, 
when you assemble it, you can see that you have a uh, index into the array, it loads the address of the function into EAX, and then it calls, uh, that, uh, calls EAX. So basically, this means that your uh, function that you're, that you're calling, when you rewrite the, the binary, it's in a different address. So that, that uh, address that you had is no longer valid. So how do you actually predict the target of an in indirect control flow transfer, like call EAX, statically? So uh, our approach for this is that you do not attempt to identify the original location of the address prior to this uh, pointer arithmetic. You instead focus on the final destination, the final target, and rewrite the control flow transfer to have a mapping from old addresses to new addresses and use that mapping at the point of use to translate that address and jump to the correct location. So this is a uh, dynamic uh, lookup at, at runtime that is uh, how you actually know what the address is. So the third challenge is differentiating between code and inline data that's in the, uh, the, the, the code. So as you see here, this handwritten assembly has some strings interleaved with the assembly. So the, 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 the code that we have here after the inline strings, when you actually disassemble with object dump, you get garbage for those uh, data bytes. So it looks like you have, um, it looks like you have these instructions, but those are garbage instructions, and it changes the alignment of instructions that you're trying to disassemble afterwards. So what it means is that if you have linear sweep disassembly, you're, you're gonna have incorrect offsets, your disassembly is gonna fail, and if you try to resort to recursive traversal, it doesn't have full coverage. So the approach to take here is disassembling from every possible offset. Obtain a superset of all of the code that could execute. You know that the intended ins uh, instructions that the program originally intended are in that superset somewhere. And since you have that superset, you're gonna have some unintended instructions as well, but you're gonna have every possible flow that could occur. And this has been uh, approached before, but really not from the perspective of rewriting. It's been focused on more by uh, uh, reverse engineering of malware. So we're applying this for, for rewriting. So we come to the fourth challenge, which is callbacks and library functions. So you can see here we have a call to Q sort, which is a library function that will sort uh, an array. And you pass in a callback to a comparison function, which will tell it how to actually sort. So here we have GT and LT, which are passed to Q sort depending on the process ID. And for this example that we see here in the disassembly, the GT, address of GT is passed to QSort, and if QSort executes this, uh, uh, it, when QSort executes, it's going to be calling the address of uh, GT. But we may have rewritten GT in our, when we are rewriting. So that means that the, uh, the callback will no longer be valid, it would crash. So what do we do? We rewrite all of the code, including the libraries, and this means that we have control over the library code as well. When we encounter that callback, we dynamically translate upon the use when it's about to call that callback, we translate it from an old address to a new address. And that brings me to the final challenge that I'm going to talk about, which is position independent code. So in this case, in print array, we have a call to i686.getpcthunk.bx, which on 32-bit x86 binaries will obtain the instruction pointer. And in x86 32-bit, the only way to obtain the instruction pointer is through a call instruction. So basically when it's called, the return address is pushed on the stack, and then that is used to get an offset to look at code that is, uh, to look at a data an off that's offset from the code. Unfortunately, when we rewrite the binary, that offset may no longer be valid. So we need to address this. How do we, uh, how do we update this 
so that the position independent code is able to access the data that it's trying to access. So what we do is we rewrite all call instructions. We convert call instructions to a push jump in which we push the old address, not the new address. And then we can uh, rewrite the return instructions as well so that when we pop off the old address, we translate it and, uh, in, into the new address at that point. So that means that what you see on the stack actually would be the identical stack of the original program. It would look the same to the original program. So this is an overview of multiverse and uh, how we, we um, have implemented our framework. So it has two phases, a mapping phase and a rewriting phase. The mapping phase is necessary because the rewriting phase requires a, the mapping that we generate. So we, we, we build a mapping so that we actually know the target destinations and then we can generate the instructions that actually jump to those targets. So uh, our first mapping phase, we disassemble starting from every byte using our superset disassembly, create that mapping and in the rewriting phase, we translate the instructions into their final rewritten forms with our mapping. So the superset disassembly that I mentioned earlier is uh, important for being able to obtain all uh, the superset of, of, the, of the, uh, the code. So it's fairly straightforward. You start disassembly at the first byte and you disassemble until one of three conditions is true. Either an invalid instruction coding is encountered, in which case you know you can stop. Uh, a disassembled offset is, our, is encountered or the end of the byte sequence, the end of the text section. So if the offset was found in a previous sequence, we insert a jump to that previous sequence. Uh, otherwise, if we're not at the end of the sequence, then just continue going uh, to the next byte until you've disassembled everything. So what it looks like here is, say you start at offset zero, that's how you'd begin, and you disassemble until you encounter an invalid instruction or the end of the text section. Then you start from offset one, and in this example, we encounter a, an already disassembled offset, and so we insert a jump to the previous one. Same with offset two. Offset three, let's say that we encounter a invalid instruction, so we stop there, and so on. So when we rewrite this, this code, when we do all this disassembly, we need to have a mapping from old addresses to new addresses. So to do this, we store the mapping alongside the new text section for the main binary and all of the libraries that are used, since we also rewrite all the libraries. However, from the main binary, you don't necessarily know where the, the rewritten library code is, and so we added a global lookup that is able to look up the local lookups of the libraries and the main binary. So for a local lookup, it's fairly uh, simple two-step process. In the new text, you have a, uh, an instruction that needs to uh, look up an ad address. You call the local lookup, which we've inserted in, into the new text section, since we have control over the new text section, and it looks in the local mapping and obtains the, the new address. However, if you are uh, needing to look at something in, say, libc, then you have a call to the global lookup, which then looks at up the local lookup and obtains it in the local mapping of, of libc, and it's able to, to obtain the address from there. So this approach is very general, but it gives us some overhead. So if we can safely relax our constraints, if we can say, well, we've started from a, a foundation without heuristics, but we want to roll things back a little bit, then we maybe can do certain optimizations. Say we really only want to rewrite the main binary, well, we can, but we then have to handle the callbacks. So we can keep a list of callback functions, and so that makes it so that's a more manual effort. But if you can, you can do that optimization if you're willing to do that maintenance of, of having a list of callbacks. Uh, another optimization is you assume that the binary is well-behaved with position-independent code and goes through library, uh, the PC thunk function, which is true for a lot of binaries. And you, if you can do this, you get a great performance improvement. So the result, as you can see here, the first bar is no heuristics, rewriting everything. Uh, second one is rewriting only the main binary. And the third one is with both optimizations with, without generic position-independent code. And as you can see, you can't, it's so, somewhat high overhead for, say, Omnet PP. You've got 288%. Uh, but once you add some of these, just a couple of optimizations, you can bring the, the overhead down a lot. And it's sort of the price you have to pay for um, no heuristics at all being able to rewrite arbitrary 
assembly. So a rewriter is not so interesting if you cannot actually insert your own code. So we ended up adding a simple API in order to insert instrumentation uh, assembly. And we Im uh, implemented a simple instruction counting uh, instrumentation. So we insert a counter that we increment for each instruction. And we compare it with a, a identical behavior pin tool. And here is the performance. This is the results may be a bit surprising because the, the overhead for the pin tool, as you can see for uh, Perl Bench, is uh, 25 times for, for pin, whereas it's a uh, little over two times for, for multiverse. So the reason is that you can, you can implement better instruction counting than this in pin if you do it at the basic block level. But we're, for our test here, we're doing it at the instruction level where every instruction is implemented. If you need to do instrumentation where you're, you're instrumenting almost every instruction, then pin is going to have some, some hefty overhead um, because you normally would be trying to do it at, at a block level. But if you have to do it in instruction level, then, then we actually can have better performance than pin here. Then uh, instruction counting, while nice, is really, again, not the most practical example of, of, uh, of what you can do with a rewriter. So we decided to implement a, uh, an actual security application. So for this, we implemented a form of backward edge CFI, a shadow stack, and compared it again with pin. So the results are similar to the previous. The overhead from pin is fairly high. It, this, we implement the shadow stack itself in pin with the C++ API. So it, we had a bit more trouble getting to the, uh, getting it, uh, we, 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 this is the same behavior, but being able to get the performance, we just had, had trouble with that. Um, it's the, it's like the same implementation, same behavior, but it's um, uh, really, we were able to, the assembly that we inserted for multiverse just gave us way better performance. So for our, our work, we, in this talk and in the paper, we only talk about 32-bit binaries, but we actually now have 64-bit support for multiverse. We've implemented that since we submitted the paper. Uh, however, the, the performance could be better. We've got some ideas about how to improve it. That generality really, some, in some cases, does, does hit us in performance. Um, and our API right now is fairly primitive, but we're working on a, a, a C API to insert uh, C code as well. And so in conclusion, uh, presented a uh, multiverse, a heuristic free rewriter that uh, works for x86 and now 64-bit binaries that uh, is useful for many security applications. We demonstrated that it works with, uh, with a shadow stack. And the source code is available. You can see it here um, on, on GitHub at utds 3 lab slash multiverse. So the code is up now. So thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, since we're slightly over time, so we may have time to, uh, just for one quick question. Very quick question. <laughs> I was somewhat surprised by the overhead of the shadow stack as there are dynamic binary translation approaches that have like 15% overhead on, uh, on spec CPU on, on average. And it seemed like incredibly high. It was basically the, the, the type of shadow stack in obtaining. So depending on the shadow stack implementation, you may be able to get, you, well, you can get, get performance that wasn't that. But get, to get the, the exact same for, for the sh type of shadow stack that we implemented, that the that was what the, the, the obtaining that behavior that was the 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 performance that we got. You, there's details in the paper about actually the, the shadow stack that we implemented. Okay, but yes, you it is sort of a surprise. Release the pin tool code as well. Um, I think we we can. I think I the um, I, I think mean, again. I, I'm, we can I'm go highly offline surprised. for that, but. <laughs> I'm going to cut you off here. Uh, let's thank the speaker one more time, Eric, one more time. Uh,